Aloha. It's, Jan it's June the 2nd, not January the 2nd. It's June the 2nd, 2021. Welcome to What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is GOP Kills the January 6th Commission. Why? And before I introduce my guests, I think I'd just like to try to take a little, a little stab at that last part of the, the title, and that is why. You know, Mitch McConnell, um, his comments about the January 6th commission and why he doesn't support it, why he actively uh, whipped against it uh, in the Senate, he said that um, there's going to be no new facts and there's nothing new that's going to come forward and that only the Democrats will use as a, as a polit political exercise uh, to, to come after the Republicans for the 2022 midterm elections. So that's why Mitch McConnell didn't want to do it, even though his statement is so very clear after on Jan uh, January 7th, the statement was clear that uh, Donald Trump was responsible for this and there, there needs to be a reckoning for it. But now there's no reckoning for it. He doesn't want it. So what did, um, what did Joe Manchin have to say about it? Because Joe Manchin's a critical part of this. Joe Manchin may be part of the, uh, the, the amendments, if you will, of the filibuster or you know, some of the rule changes or even the elimination of the filibuster. So what did Joe Manchin say about it? He said the following. There is no exercise for any Republican to vote against this commission since Democrats have agreed to everything they asked for. Mitch McConnell has made this political position thinking that it will help his 2022 elections. They do not believe the truth will set you free so they continue to live in fear. And that kind of sums it up pretty well. So without further ado, let me go to my guests. Today we have Jay Fidel. Today we have Stephanie Dalton, our Washington DC Bureau Chief. And today we have Cynthia Lee Sinclair, our correspondent, and Winston Welch, who's not here, who's currently on assignment. He'll be with us next week. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to What Now America. Good morning, Tim. Uh, Jay, in addition to what we heard from uh, Joe Manchin and others in the Senate and the House, there was 35 House representatives that voted for the commission. There were six GOP Republicans who voted for the commission, yet it failed. It was filibustered. Was it because uh, they're truly worried about the 2022 midterm elections? Or was it more they, they were scared of Donald Trump and what Donald Trump wants them to do and how to vote? You have to say both. You know, this reminds me of um, Ann Applebaum's article in The Atlantic six months ago, <clears throat> where she pointed out like six or seven reasons why um, perfectly um, responsible members of government in Eastern Europe capitulated to um, you know, authoritarian government there. And one, uh, one of the reasons, there was a number of them, one of the reasons was fear. And that's a common denominator for the move to authoritarian government. If you saw uh, Rachel last night, um, she was on the same path. We're, we're talking about a move that's going, you know, toward the end of democracy. Talk about a, a book by a fellow named Ben Rhodes, who was in the Obama administration. Brilliant book, gotta, gotta find that book. Uh, just coming out today. Um, anyway, I was telling you before the show that I think I figured something out here. So you know what it's not. It's not for truth. They're not up for truth. It's not for democracy. It's anti-truth and anti-democracy, clear enough. And there may be fear, fear of, of losing power, uh, fear of, you know, of Trump, those things, I think they're all in play. But what strikes me is this is so similar to the GOP result in the first impeachment. Remember how they blew that off? They criticized the, uh, the Democrats for the way they did it in the House. And then they voted not even to have a hearing in the Senate. Remember that? And the second impeachment, you know, which was based on the January 6th event, uh, where they just said no. We're not going to impeach him. Extraordinary after it was so clear what he did. But I don't think McConnell is right, by the way, about, you know, we know it all. We don't know it all. 
there's a whole lot more to know about the GOP members of the Senate and Congress who arguably, allegedly participated in all of this and maybe even fomented it and assisted in the conspiracy. And I don't think they want anybody to know about that. It would be the end of their, at least their legitimate careers. No, I think, um, you know, when you put all that together and you see how the GOP voted on the commission bill just a few days ago, uh, I think what this is, it's a message. It's a message that the GOP can do whatever it wants, that the GOP, especially Trump, can shoot people, clearly felonious crime, and get away with it. And that's the message to the base. It's not that it's right. It's not that it's democratic. As a matter of fact, it undermines the country in every which way. It's a statement of power. It's a statement of we can do whatever we want to do. And that has happened how many times already? It's messaging and it's working. And I, for one, am very concerned. Let me ask you, are the Democrats naive to this, uh, this plausible position of yours? Are they naive and they uh, continue like many times Democrats will do? Absolutely nothing about it. Or do they wake up and say, hey, we are at a, we're at a crisis at the gate here. And we need to take proactive steps to stop it. Almost like what the uh, Democrats did in Texas when they walked out of the, uh, the, uh, the legislature on this uh, voting, voting rights bill in Texas. They walked mm -hmm. out. They said, this bill is serious enough that we have to protest vehemently against it, not our usual sit in the chair and twiddle our thumbs approach. I agree with you. And not everybody will, but I agree with you. I, and I think the implication of your question is that the stakes are high. The country is at risk. When you think about it, and we hear, um, you know, on America What Now, we think about it. And I think um, that, that the, the Democratic Party has to get its act together and take, and take strong steps. Now, we'll see what happens in the House. We'll see uh, what Nancy Pelosi does about a hearing. Um, we'll see about, you know, alternative methods of investigation. You know, we have, a, we have a show called Transitional Justice, and it deals largely with justice against atrocities in Africa. And one of the common denominators is that if you have atrocities, the people who conduct them don't want them to be public. That's the, sort of the, you know, the, the, the 10th inning of, of atrocities. They don't want it to be public. And what has to happen in all those countries in Africa, especially in Sudan, is you have to have a truth commission. You have to tell people, you have to find out, you have to let them know what happened so it doesn't happen again. And, um, you know, that's what we have to do now. The Democrats have to do that. Uh, so your, your question, you know, about whether they are aware, I think they are aware, but I think, you know, they're slightly infected. They don't want to take big chances. I think we all have to take big, huge chances or our lives, fortunes, and sacred honor will be forfeit. Okay, thanks, Jay. Hey, Stephanie, um, Nancy Pelosi made four points of where we could go forward since the GOP filibustered the January 6th commission vote in the Senate. And she said, we could either have another vote and uh, do it that way, where, um, you know, they just round the troops up and, and, and just vote again in the Senate. Or they can have a House Select Committee be formed and start the investigation that way. Or let the existing agencies, the FBI, um, agencies like that, continue their investigation and see what information is reported out. Or they can do a, um, a combination of, of uh, all those that are doing current investigations and combine them and consolidate them into one investigation. Now, there's one thing she didn't mention, and that is um, the power of the president. Joe Biden can set up a commission. Uh, president Lyndon B. Jo Johnson did that uh, just after the assassination of Kennedy. And he, on uh, January, excuse me, November 29th, 1963, Executive Order 11130, um, tapped the shoulders of Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and they had what is called the Warren Commission. So there's another option. Uh, what do you think moving forward should be done, Stephanie? Um, nothing, just accept the vote or 
should Nancy Pelosi conduct a House uh, Select Committee and fill it with uh, 50% of GOP seats, 50% Democrats? Or as uh, suggested by, I think it was um, Keith Overman, forget it. Just have Biden conduct a committee, a uh, commission, and don't load it with any GOP because it's their sole purpose to block it, to, to uh, diminish the truth that is reported on it. And uh, forget it. Just let them report the truth and the truth will set you free. What do you think, uh, what option do you prefer? <laughs> you are the question. I gave you a lot. I give you a lot. <laughs> you know, we would be less than fair to them if we didn't just Benghazi them all over the congressional schedule. Well, that might be the that might be what happens. And that is just the only way to go. But ultimately, I believe that we're in much better shape and that Biden is in much better shape to have a commission because what they will do on the deal they worked out together for for a bicameral um, uh, commission is they will put someone on it who's just so obstructionist that it would just bail, put it down, you know, into bog, you know, for as long as it could, like a Jim Jordan or somebody like that, to just get in the way of it. So it won't be bipartisan. It'll be just uh, one, one staggering around after another to try and block the progress. So let's go with the Benghazi model and let them have it. How many times <laughs> we don't even once we get one done, we can do another. But I wanted to mention the NPR has been doing a lot of programming on the history of um, the, the uh, African-American in the country, and especially in relation to the kinds of atrocities that they're talking about now, like with the um, the, the town in, near Tulsa that was eradicated. And I guess there's one in Florida. Greenwood if not more. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> one of the interesting facts that were was discussed is that the Second Amendment was only put in the Constitution by the founders because of the fear that there was that there would be uprisings on plantations and people that were in servitude would get to the point where they would rise and fight. And the second amendment was put in place in order to allow the holding of firearms and the organized militia and, and having organized militia to, to handle these kinds of uprisings. And it evolved into only the white people could have guns, I guess men, only the white men could have guns, blacks couldn't even have guns. But they've been up to these tricks since the get-go, the suppression of the vote, the, the uh, an inauguration of the second amendment, which I was really surprised to hear that that was what was in the background of getting that into our, our systems paperwork. So yeah. Well, now, it's, now it seems the uprising would be white, white nationalist extremists. That's the uprising that's, that's pending right now. Um, and they are loaded to the teeth. We have over 340 million guns and we have 320 million people. Um, you know, and we, we like to look at this uh, January 6th as something that has happened in the past and it's, the threat is over. The threat is not over. Um, just to break into a little segue here, uh, just this weekend we had a Lieutenant General, remember Michael Flynn, uh, the security advisor for Donald Trump and recently pardoned by Donald Trump. Um, he was on a QAnon convention. And uh, one of the audience members said, you know, what happened in Myanmar, which was the, the military junta took over the government again, uh, what happened in Myanmar, why shouldn't that happen here? And uh, Flynn, Flynn was quoted to say, no reason, I mean it should happen. Okay, That's so- here we are. Oh, go he ahead. Walked it back the rest of the day. Yeah, but, he but walked that it would, back, but the video can't be walked back. Well, McMaster, uh, some of the other leading leading commentators um, say there's something wrong with this man. Ever since he was fired from his position in the Obama Commission in the Obama administration, where wasn't he the head of the CIA or the DEA or one of those major um, organizations? And um, ever the since is then, he's whipping up. He's whipping up these ideas. So regardless if he's a, you know, a nutcase or not, he's whipping up these guys with a whole lot of weaponry. Uh, you know, Liz Cheney said, no American should advocate support uh, 
you know, should advocate, uh, advocate the overthrow of the United States. No one, well, no one should be doing it. And that includes I mean, Donald Trump. Yeah, and, and, and what's such a shock to me is that there's nothing that is done about any of these things. It's happening over and over, unthinkable, traitorous, traitor, traitorous comments are made over and over that disregarding our system and tearing it down and eroding okay. inst oh, institutions. How can this, this commentary continue on? That's not free. Okay. There we go. So remember Lieutenant Colonel Eugene Vidman, who was in the, um, yes. who testified before Congress? In the first. Um, the impeachment? Yeah. Impeachment, yeah. Well, he said the following. With these sedition remarks, Comrade Flynn may have crossed the line and, and not be qualified for active duty and possibly for court martial. As a JAG, which means you're an attorney for the military, as a JAG, I'm qualified and also happy to prosecute the case. So once again, uh, Mr. Flynn may have crossed the line. Who knows? What, what's going to happen? I mean, who's going to follow up on that? I don't know. Is this a Justice Department thing? Or, um, I mean, already they're so laden with cases, but I don't know. Hopefully we have the... You, ra you raise a good point. How many cases can you prosecute? If it's happening so ubiquitously around the country, involving so many people doing so many outrageous things and making so many outrageous remarks, do we have the resources to prosecute them all? This is a wave of change, and it's very threatening because we don't have the resources to prosecute them all. So Let me go to Cynthia on this. Cynthia, what Jay just said, do we have the resources? Should there be prosecutions? And how fast, if there is a commission report or a House Select Committee, uh, should that be done right away? Or, or take uh, Stephanie's suggestion that you bleed it out for two years like the Benghazi hearings? Well, I say start it right now and then bleed it out for two years. Both. Not, there is not a one or the other in that thing. And if we don't have the resources to do this, then we need to get the resources to do this. because. This isn't going away. This is the thing that gets me the most about all of this. January 6th is not a one-off thing. We've got, like you say, we've got Mike, you know, Mike Flynn out there saying these things. We've got Sidney Powell on TV saying that um, President Trump is going to be put back in office as the president. And I'm like, what? And I'm thinking, well, and, we have reports that Don, uh, Donald Trump is talking to folks. Now, I don't know how, how real this story is. I, I don't know, so I'll, 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 I'll qualify it that way. But he's talking to people saying, I'll be reinstalled as president by August. Yeah. Is this just a coincidence, or is there some, something afoot here? I think something's afoot because it's a very specific thing that both Sidney Powell said, too, in August. And now he's saying, in August. So... How do we protect ourselves between now and then? And as much as we need that, we I should say needed that January 6th commission, um, in a way I'm glad it's gone because now we can go forward without this bipartisan drag their feet, get in the way of everything kind of, I mean, they agreed to everything the Republicans wanted, you know, that, Subpoena power on both sides. All the, all the stuff that they wanted, they got. And still they voted against Let it. me ask you this. Um, the six senators that voted for this, and I'll, I'll list them off here. Uh, Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of uh, Alaska, uh, Rob Porter of Ohio, Mitt Romney of, of, of uh, Utah, and Ben Sass of Nebraska. Should they be tapped to be honest brokers in this commission? Or should it just be Democrats only saying, we don't care anymore. We're just going to report the truth as we find it. And we're not going to be, um, we're not going to be delayed. And we're not going to have the truth uh, um, diminished or whitewashed. I think that it will be accepted. It'll be more widely accepted, whatever the results are, if we have Republicans on that, that committee that goes after this stuff. But... Um, so who's an honest broker of the Republicans? Ooh. Lindsey Graham? <laughs> Should Lindsey Graham be on there? <laughs> That's funny. I yeah, mean, it is. <laughs> Lindsey Graham, 
I think um, that Mitch McConnell, I think Jim Jordan, I think all these guys, Ron, uh, what's the guy that's always, uh, the white haired, I can't remember his last name. Well, yeah. Um, and then these guys all are, they're not just complicit. They're not just complicit by being silent. I believe they're involved. But the way the Republican Party was so in the same corner, all together on the same page, they would have to have more information in order to be on the same page. So some of them on the outer things, maybe not, but those main core guys, they knew exactly what was going on. We know that there, that Mike Flynn and the Sidney Powell that were both there on the day, what, the two days before the commission, I mean, before the January 6th insurrection, encouraging Trump to um, create a, a martial law. So we know that there was probably more than just three people in that room, right? I would say there's, the chances are good. And then we know about Kevin McCarthy over in the house on the phone with him, you know, not wanting to be called, I'm sure, or subpoenaed because yeah. he stuff that could, you know, um, show his guilt. Okay. Does, Thank does you. Yes, go ahead, Stephanie. Statue of limitations on when this commission can be launched. Is there a statute? No, oh, the 9-11 took over a year, over a year to form. So Go no, I, I don't think so. Would it be, okay, then I say move on and let's make sure we get the um, that bill through uh, somehow that's going to write these um, suppression laws. What, what bill, Stephanie? You can't get a bill through without the Senate. Right. And it, we still have the filibuster. So there's going to be no bill. Well, I think there can be an investigation by a committee in the House, and there can be an investigation under the auspices of the executive. Those are the two possibilities yeah. for, and I, and I would say that you know that the press not doing anybody any good. Um, they are merely arguing what might come out, what did come out, uh, and the reasons and all that. But they're not actually, um, you know, talking about getting into an investigation, a serious legal investigation. And you know, my metronome theory, it's tick, 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 the days go by and Vladimir is happy with the passing of every day. And so is Mitch McConnell and so is Donald Trump. Oh, uh, speaking think, of I Putin, he, speaking he, of Putin, Jay, um, uh, the representative for Russia uh, just recently said that uh, Putin feels that these people who are being prosecuted for the insurrection, they're being, Persecuted, and he supports them. Of course, we need. He to should get... run for the Senate. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he should run for president. He could probably get himself in. If okay. Biden could be listening to my my request, get back to what's important. We've got to get the people uh, that can vote voting. We've got to work on that. He needs to work on on getting. Um, Stephanie, it's been six months. OK, and more. It's been eight months since the election and since the big lie has come around and has been showered upon us daily. And but, so and so where is H.R. one? Nowhere. And I and I have to say that I blame the Democrats for not moving on it somehow. Um, you know, and the Democratic Party round the round the country. I think Rachel was making that point last night. Um, point is that you have you have all the there's dozens of state legislatures that are passing anti-voting bills and directed, you know, racially. And they're outrageous and they are vi violation of the constitution. It's not clear whether the courts will or when will, they'll do anything about it. Um, and, and meanwhile, uh, the Democrats are powerless. They, they can't get HR one through, they're not gonna get, isn't it clear? They're not gonna get it through. What so what okay, well, speaking of powerless, here's a question from a viewer, Jane. I'll go to you on this. And that is, why is not the FBI arresting Trump for his seditious planning? Is there any bureau doing anything about Trump? So we go to the powerless question that you just brought up. Why isn't anything being done? Well, I'm going to give you a short answer, Tim. Tomorrow, 
on America finding its way. We're going to discuss the legal options that are available <laughs> to make that happen. Okay. I can hardly wait. None of us can hardly wait, right? <laughs> you know, in the 30s, they would call that a cliffhanger. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> now, the bottom line is, um, you know, it, we have a, what do you want to call it? A democratic mechanism. But if you look at the world today, again, going back to Rachel Maddow, um, you see that, that we are moving uh, in a way that uh, is, is inexorably toward authoritarianism country after country. And, and it, 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 that's what's happening in the world today. Countries that might have been fairly liberal a few years ago are moving under dictators to more authoritarian governments. And, and I think we are too. Otherwise, this would not be happening. 70 million people vote for that guy. And now the Congress is completely disabled and, and voting against truth, against democracy every time. So, you know, the question is, here's the big question, and I, we don't have to get to it today, but maybe soon. Will this change be nonviolent, or will it be violent? I'm gonna get- Question, that's, that's a, could be yeah. a rhetorical question at that, but I, that's a great question. But the question is, why isn't Biden dealing with the Joe Manchin issue? Now, all that Jay says is so true. So what should Biden be focusing on now? HR1 and getting this guy in line. Okay. Right? Steph what about that? Stephanie, did Joe Manchin learn anything from this uh, filibuster of the commission? He did said, he learn anything or is he, he still playing cute? Well, he said he was shocked and surprised and disappointed that, that, that nobody would uh, vote for the commission. He did say that, but I haven't heard anything about him since. Have you? Well, does that help him become a voice to uh, refurbish? the filibuster, not eliminate it, but refurbish it. Yeah, so why isn't Biden happen, having him up to the White House to have some talk turkey and, and other approaches? That's what I don't get, because the only thing that counts is getting the voting situation under control through HR1. We've got to get in place to have the federal overlay on, on this malfeasance, uh, these laws that are wrong and are excluding people. And the only way to do that is to get it through on the vote Biden can have if he gets Joe Manchin on board, and I guess Cinema too. But but nevertheless, well, I'm I'm perplexed about that. Yeah. Why is that not number? I think we all are. I think we all are, and that's what makes us, you know, view the Democrats as, as spineless, and and you know they won't stand on their own hind legs to, to you know to advocate for themselves. I, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more, Cynthia. I, I'm just saying, let's, I hope the Secret Service is paying attention to that because this, this is not good news. Yeah. Cynthia, does the, um, the vote to filibuster the commission in the Senate, does that lead further into the big lie? The big lie that Donald Trump's election was stolen and he's the rightful president? Well, you mean the fact that we don't, I'm not quite sure what your question was. Well, the question is, does that feed those with, uh, you know, the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys, um, potentially, part of 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump, does it further feed their, does it confirm what they already have le been led to believe by Donald Trump is that the election was truly fraudulent and the election was truly stolen from them. Therefore, returning the presidency to the, to the Donald Trump is with, with or without violence is um, a means to an end. And it, it is valid to do so because they're patriots. They'll be yeah. patriots if they return Donald Trump to be president of the United States. Does it feed into that? The filibuster? Is that what you're asking? The filibuster? Yeah. Does that further feed into their conspiracy? Oh, absolutely it does. Of course it does. Why? How does it do that? Anything that gives them power, anything that gives them even a minute of cover for the big lie, because that's what is behind all of this. It's behind the voting the, the horrible voting, draconian voting laws that are being passed. It's behind the January 6th insurrection. And so if the big lie is still out there, then, then that means that we're going to have another January 6th. This isn't the only okay, one. Let me ask you this. Why doesn't President Biden have a special, a presidential, um, not, a, not even a press conference, but an address to the nation? Uh, every president's done it, a special address to the nation and address the big lie specifically and only. I don't understand why he doesn't do that. 
I think partly he's driven because he doesn't want to do the um, you're the bad guy. No, we're the bad guy. No, we're all the finger pointing stuff, right? I think that's what he's trying to avoid. He wants this whole bipartisan thing. And I understand, I understand it. But by the same token, I think he's wrong. I think he's yeah. dead. I do too. And I, I learned something a long time ago. Never leave a room when someone's a, you know, accusing you of something you didn't do and you don't address it and you've left the room. And yeah. that's what Joe Biden's doing right now. He's not addressing the big white elephant, the big lie in the room. I, I absolutely right. agree with you. And I yeah. think, and the more it goes, like, like Jay said, you know, with that metronome tick tocking away, the further away it gets, the less relevant it will be. So the less sense it will make, and then the more partisan it will seem. So doing it now, it would make sense. Down the road, it won't. So okay. I yeah of time he's got to do it soon all right well we've out of time we're going to go around the the table here jay your last comments about the commission or or things related to it well i, I take a, a page out of cynthia's book you know every day that goes by is worse for the democrats they they seem powerless they're not doing anything they need to take chances biden has to get up and, and make a speech and the Democratic Party has to come together and deal with all those state legislators. It is not doing that. Um, so you get these uh, relatively benign remarks that he makes, and you, you don't get a sense of pushback on this. Now, what's happening is because of the passage of time, I think that the Trumpers are getting stronger and they're coming together. They're networking more than even before. And, and I don't think it's a joke about August. I think what's going to happen in August is another another run, um, perhaps while the uh, Congress is in on vacation. That's what happens in August um, against against the government. And uh, you know the word coup does come to mind. And if we're not prepared for that, it will happen. It almost happened in January, and now the now the Republicans and the Trumpers understand better how to do that sort of thing. So I think we're, you know, we're we're on a we're on the road to, you know, hell, and um, I, and I think it it will be a coup rather than widespread violence, but that I wouldn't rule that out either. What's happening now is is really remarkable. One other point before I leave you, and that is this: Do you think that those seventy million people all believe the big lie? Do you think that those Republicans in Congress and in these state legislatures? believe that there's a need to you know, clamp down on, um, on voting? You, no, they know they're sentient. They went to some school. Um, they know that it's a lie, but they accept the lie because it's fashionable and because it gives them power. And power. it's part of a network and a message coming from Trump um, that and he can do Fifth Avenue and he can do it all. And they buy that because it's not the question of truth anymore. It's a question of whether you accept the message. And to what degree are you willing to accept it for your power? Yeah. yeah. To, to what degree do you really love this country? Yeah. And if your life isn't quite so good, if you have a beef on this or that, then maybe you don't love the country. And maybe you're happy to see change in whatever form. This is really nutcakes, but this is what's happened in other countries. Yeah. Stephanie, your last comments? Okay, I agree with what you all say. I think uh, I don't want to criticize Biden, but I think that we're on to something here. And also with regard to the fraud in the election, why isn't something coming back with, and where did these 70 million votes come from for Trump? And if that's not enough thing to go back and start taking an audit on those votes, let's go back to 2016. Where did those votes come from? Let's take a look at those ballots. So I just think you know, there's things here that, that can be, uh, you know, ha uh, come out and lick these guys with and, and take it on. I mean, there's some, we never did do anything about the 2016, 2016 election. Now, yeah. that's rife with, you want fraud? Let's go find some fraud. I'll bet you we can find that, including- All in right. Thank you, Stephanie. we got to wrap up. Cynthia, very quickly, please, your last comments. I agree with Stephanie. Um, 
and I, but you know, it's that whole fight fire with fire thing, you know, how do you, where's the balance? I, I'm not sure exactly, but I know one thing we've got more and more charges that are mounting up and, and they're sort of escalating also against Trump. Right. So that if somehow we could put all of the FBI's energy into that, we've got a few of the January 6th insurrectionists that are pleading guilty and turning state's evidence. Um, and they're coming out with, we were just there because the president told us to be there. So um, these kinds of things are gonna keep mounting, but we gotta hurry up and get them done. So yeah, time is of the essence. That too far, yeah, time is of the essence. essence. Yeah, so speaking of time of the essence, we've run out of time here. So I, I wanna thank all of you, Jay Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, and of course, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Thank you for joining us on What Now America. I can't wait for Thursday for Jay's show, uh, uh, America Finding Its Way. I wanna hear the answers, all of them. So join us next week also, Wednesday at 11 o'clock for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicell, your host, and we will see you then. Aloha.